Today is August 7th, 2024, and my guest is Richard Reeves. He's the president and founder of the American Institute for Boys and Men, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. His most recent book is Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It. Today, we're going to talk about boys and men and the challenges they're facing in this moment. Richard, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you for having me on, Russ. I'm really looking forward to this. Now, you highlight three challenges uh, that face men and, and sometimes boys in education, in the workplace, in the family. I'd like to go through those uh, one at a time. And it, it's reasonable, let's start with education when it's boys, mostly. Uh, what's, what's the crisis in, in uh, boys and young men's education? To everybody's surprise, there's a very large gender gap in education now in every advanced economy. I'll talk mostly about the US, but with boys and men behind. Obviously, we're used to thinking about gender gaps that go the other way, and for a long time it was that way. But boys and men are behind girls and women throughout the education system and falling further and further behind. And that's particularly true if they're from a low-income community or household uh, and or if they're black. But just to put a few data points on, on the table, because I, I know you'll, in, you'll enjoy getting some empirical specificity here. Boys are behind girls through, throughout school, especially throughout K-12 education, uh, especially in subjects like English and literacy. So in the, in the median school district in the US, boys are almost a grade level behind in English and literacy. By the end of high school, we see the gap really showing up in GPA. Interestingly, not in standardized tests. So if you look at SAT, ACT scores, the typical standardized tests, there isn't really a gender gap. But in GPA, grade point average, there's a massive gender gap. So the top 10% of students measured by their GPA break two-thirds female, one-third male. And the bottom 10% of high school students by GPA is the other way around. There's two-thirds of that bottom 10% are boys. That then flows into the higher education system where there's a large and growing gap uh, with girls and women outperforming boys and men at every stage, much more likely to enroll, or, or if you want to put it the other way around, boys much less likely to enroll. So since 2010, college enrollment has dropped by about 1.2 million in the US, which is kind of expected because of the demographic changes. But of that 1.2 million drop, a million of the drop is men. Campuses are about 60, 40 now. Uh, and there's actually a slightly female. bigger gap. Of, uh, sorry, female, yeah. There's a slightly bigger gap now uh, in getting a four-year college degree in favor of women than there was in favor of men in the 70s, in the early 70s. And that's a good data point to emphasize because in 1972, the US passed Title IX, a big, bill, a big piece of legislation to promote women in higher education especially. And at that point, men were about 13 percentage points more likely to get a four-year college degree than women. Now, women are about 16 percentage points more likely to get a college degree than men. And so we've got slightly wider gender inequality today on college campuses than we did in 72 when we passed Title IX, but it's completely reversed. And again, it's worth emphasizing that wasn't predicted. No one was planning for that world, as we were quite rightly fighting for more equality for women and girls. No one expected that the lines would just keep going. And on current trends, I don't see much, much sign that that trend is going to reverse. If anything, we see it, we see it going forward into the future. One of the things you point to, which is fascinating, two things that were fascinating for me, just to start with. One is Title IX, which I mistakenly thought was mostly about sports and women's participation in sports. It did have a big effect on that, but it had a much wider uh, impact than just on uh, women participating in sports at the college level. Uh, but the other thing was uh, differences in cognitive development. Uh, some, I think there's some general awareness that men mature at a different rate than women, but you have a very nice, uh, stark, clear understanding of the nature of that and the speed. So talk about that. Yeah, so when you when you look at this intriguing difference in the gender gap in something like GPA versus say standardized tests, what what I th what I think that's telling us is it's not really that there's much of an intelligence gap in favor of girls, right? So I think I can say reasonably confidently that there's no evidence that girls are more intelligent than boys. 
or vice versa, just obviously to make it clear to you. So that's what I think is showing up in these standardized tests. But GPA, and actually most of the ways we think about educational performance now, they don't just reward intelligence, they reward the ability to organize yourself, to stick with a task, to turn in your homework, uh, to have some future orientation. And that comes with a degree of maturity, which are around these executive functioning skills or whatever you want to call them. And because girls develop a little bit earlier than boys, especially in those skills, whatever you want to call them, soft skills, life skills, there's a whole bunch of labels for them, but they're basically not just about how smart you are, they're about whether you can get your act together, right? Because um, turning your homework in, and I speak as a father of three sons, actually completing a homework assignment and turning it in is a very difficult task for a 15-year-old boy. And it just turns out to be that much harder for a 15-year-old boy on average than for a 15-year-old girl. Um, and every parent knows that. Every teacher knows that. They know that on average, if you ask the girls to open up their book bags, they're more likely to be well organized with the homework and so on in there. And you open up the boys' book bags and it's quite likely to be a controlled explosion um, with yesterday's crumpled up homework and last week's sandwich and whatever. And of course, these are averages, uh, and of course, we shouldn't use them as an excuse, but it's just it's a, it's a neuroscientific fact that the average 15-year-old boy is younger developmentally, especially in those skills, than the average 15-year-old girl. And we couldn't see that before because the education system wasn't really encouraging women and girls to go on and you know, further and faster. But now that we've taken away the artificial barriers to the performance of women and girls, we're seeing their natural advantages playing out, or if you put it a different way, the fact that there is a natural disadvantage to being a boy uh, in the in the school. It's one of the reasons why I think we should be looking hard at things like starting boys in school a year later to try and level the playing field a little bit, which a lot of affluent parents are already, already doing. Um, I'm not suggesting that's the kind of single solution. There's lots of other things we could talk about, but but it, but it's very interesting. Like you go into a school and suggest that maybe boys are a little bit behind developmentally, and every teacher's like, "Well, ha duh, you, know, you don't need <laughs> you don't need a social scientist to come in and tell you that." Yeah, I had an interesting uh, thought. I was be curious what your reaction is. Um, these observations raise the question of why now this fact that that boys struggle with, say, ex executing a multi-step uh, project as an adolescent compared to a girl. I, I don't think we saw that advantage for girls in the past, even though, of course, they had other cultural issues and we're not, we don't need to go into it. But it strikes me that homework is different in 2024 than it was in 1964. Uh, 1964, I was 10 years old, so let's move it up a little bit. So we'll go to 1968. I'm 14. I didn't get a lot of homework. <laughs> mm. There weren't a lot of projects. Uh, we mainly played after school, and we didn't have multiple assignments in multiple classes. Math, yeah, there was sometimes homework, and I'll confess I struggled to do it, uh, as did perhaps many of the boys and some mm -hmm. of the girls, no doubt. But I feel like um, American secondary education, high school education, and maybe uh, it would also include what uh, then was called junior high and now is called middle school. Uh, there is an enormous emphasis on this kind of, I'll call it jumping through hoops. It's not really education. It's not really learning. It's... Um, you know, it's a, it's a test of a lot of these skills you're talking about, which are not unimportant, by the way. I don't want to dim diminish their significance, but they're not designed necessarily to increase mastery of the subject matter. They're sort of the kind of things that are useful for getting into college and doing well in college, which it carries over into. And it raises the question of what happened to the American K-12 through education system over this period? And I think my cheap off-the-cuff answer as an economist is that Getting into the best colleges got a lot more competitive because the the bulge of the of the baby boomers going through the demographic um, pipeline meant that because there weren't large expansions in the colleges and their number of spots they had available that were prestigious, almost by definition, they stayed prestigious by not expanding, uh, meant that there were all kinds of things people were doing 
extracurricular stuff, these kind of homeworks and good grades. And it's just a very different world than when I was an adolescent. And I think it plays well to women is what you're saying. Do you think that's yeah, right? And I think, I think, I think, I think descriptively everything you've said is right. I think an unexpected or an inadvertent consequence of that has been to, in a sense, overcorrect and make the education system somewhat more female friendly now than male friendly. I think as a general proposition, the sorts of uh, behaviors that are rewarded, the kinds of ways that you grade have tilted a little bit more towards the natural strengths of girls and women. Right? I think that's true. I also just think there's a general point here you're making, which is how the stakes have just gotten risen generally around homework, extracurricular. And it's interesting, you see that's, you know, extracurricular is another area where girls are doing much better than boys. And actually what that means is that in college admissions, this is something that uh, I discovered, I'm pretty sure I discovered this after I finished the book, but there was this, there has been this move, especially during the pandemic, to go test optional in college admissions. And I'm sure you've been following this. Yeah. And now you're seeing some move back with MIT and others yeah. moving back. But there's a very good study from a Vanderbilt scholar, which actually shows that the main effect of taking standardized tests out of the admissions process or making them optional is to skew significantly further female in your undergraduate composition by four percentage points, which is a really big effect, much bigger than any effect on anything else, including race, et cetera. And, and if you think about it, that's just mechanically obvious, given the data that we've just been discussing, right? Girls are way ahead in GPA. They're way ahead in extracurricular. They're ahead by the looks of it in t teacher recommendations. The only area of college admissions competition where boys are even holding their own is in standardized tests. So if you take them out of the equation, then inevitably you're going to skew even further female. Now, I think it's worth saying that critics would, would say that in your day, um, and to some extent in my day, I'm a little bit younger than you and I was raised in the UK, but the same applies, which is that they would say there was so much emphasis on these high stakes competitive exams that actually that skewed a bit in favor of boys, right? That it just turns out that everything ain't equal boys and men just, they're a little bit more likely to kind of cruise through the courses, not turn the homework in, but then turn up on the day and do pretty well by comparison to girls. So that was seen as kind of a male centric system. And we've counterbalanced that now with more continuous assessment, GPA, et cetera. I think that the balance has now gone too far, too far that way. <laughs> um, and that we want a system that recognizes some of these differences and tries to be even handed towards both. And that leaves aside the question of how far we should be weighting standardized tests versus something like GPA. And that's a deep question, Russ, about what's education for? Who do we want in our colleges? You know, do you want people that are good at performing tasks, even when they don't, then they're a bit, bit boring, you know, that kind of, those sorts of the grit or whatever you want to call it. Well, maybe because some of those skills are exactly the ones you're going to need in the workforce. And so I think there's a, there's a, there's a set of deep challenges there. And a criticism of my work is, yeah, girls are doing better and they should be doing better because they are better and tough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could be, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to weigh in on whether it's, um, on whether we should design our education system to maximize, say, our productivity. I think that's a mistake, but that's a that's a discussion for another day. Um, yes. In a minute, we'll talk about some other policy things you've recommended, but I want to say one thing. I want you to say a, a few things about parenting. Uh, you have some very thoughtful things to say about parenting, especially if you if you have a uh, a boy and a girl. Uh, but just in general, when you're confronted with your bright but un, un, uh, unsuccessful, uh, by some metrics, son, uh, how should you interact with them? Well, the big mistake to make is to treat your son like a malfunctioning daughter or for schools to treat boys like malfunctioning girls. Uh, and so this sense of why aren't you more like your sister? It, or why aren't you more like the girls, is just a, a straightforward way of capturing what I think is a real problem, which is that if you end up with the female way of being in school, for example, or the female way of behaving, and obviously this is all on average, I'll, I'll stop saying that now because everyone listening knows, knows that distributions overlap, um, that actually if you kind of have that as your default standard, then it means you end up lacking empathy and compassion and openness and flexibility when it comes to your son. I did it with one of my kids. Uh, and the truth is that 
for a lot of boys now, the education system feels a little bit like a round hole and they feel like a square peg. And too often we're just kind of ramming them in uh, and saying, well, tough, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, and even around issues like behavior, you, know, you see there are differences on average in kind of externalizing behavior to use the psychological language, you know, but just there are huge differences, for example, in physical aggression between boys and girls at the age of 18 months. Now, <laughs> I, I, I think you, you honestly have to be a, like off the charts social determinist to think that if there's such a huge difference in that externalizing behavior at 18 months, that is not because, only because the way they've been socialized. That is a natural difference. And so you obviously want to regulate that behavior, but there's a physicality to the way that boys tend to be, which we will need to be very careful not to pathologize. We have to moderate it and regulate, but we don't want to pathologize it. Yeah. Uh one of my favorite verbs is um, <clears throat> to roughhouse, which is a very hard um, verb to translate, in, to, to, to define. Uh, anybody who's had boys knows what it is. <laughs> uh, and especially if you've had more than one uh, and, and you interact with, it's a, it's a, they're more physical. Uh, they are more likely to wrestle, uh, run around, break things, <laughs> um, and of course, as you say, and I'll, I only say it this one time, these are on average, there, there's a huge just overlapping distributions of, of boys and girls, but um, on average, boys are more physical and they have more trouble paying attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the things I haven't, um, I haven't seen you, but I'm sure you have written about it or talked about it, is um, the medicalization, the use of pharmaceuticals to try to make boys more like girls. And I think that's a terrible mistake. Yeah, that's the ultimate expression of pathologizing it, it uh, of what is you know, within the normal distribution of male behavior, um, but towards the tail of the distribution of female behavior, right? So the question then is, <laughs> to what extent is that a problem? And I, I will say, and this data is old, but it hasn't been updated, it's from 2009, that um, that's the latest data showing the share of K-12 age children who have been diagnosed at some point with a developmental disability. And the number for boys is 23%, which is twice the share of girls. And I have to tell you, if you get to the point where almost one in four members of a population have been diagnosed with a developmental disability, then I've got to say that's, that can't be right. I mean, I'm just saying that's not right. That must be the system, right? Or there's something badly wrong with the system that's literally, that's, that says, well, a quarter of you are disabled. And I think it's because of what you just said. And you, know, you see massive rise in ADD medication, et cetera. And that's almost all, but that's mostly boys, much higher rates of diagnosis uh, of ADD among boys. And so, there's a line here that's very difficult to draw, and I'm no expert, but I will say that it's quite, it, it is clear to me that we've gone way past the line in terms of now medicalizing what are actually just kind of m more not normal behavioral issues, and in a sense trying to medicate our boys into being ersatz girls in order for them to navigate an education system that's just poorly designed for them. So rather than changing the system, we're trying to change the boys. We're trying to fix the boys rather than fix the schools. Yeah, well, I'm pretty confident that if it was 23% in 2009, it's higher now. Uh, I'd wager a large sum of money on that. Um, let's talk about the two of the recommendations you make, one you mentioned in passing, which is to delay uh, boys entering school. That strikes me as um, alarming as a general principle, even though, as you point out, many parents play with birth dates and, and try to take advantage of the opportunities they have like that. And the second is to try to get more men as teachers, which fascinated me. I did not know, I think you point out that it's... Uh, K through 12, 23% of, of teachers are men. That's yeah. a surprisingly low number. Um, uh, of course, it used to be teaching was historically a female profession that changed, but that it has changed that little, uh, and I'm sure it's bounced around, is surprising. So talk about why you think those two things are important and whether you think there's any chance they're going to happen. Yeah, well, the, the idea of starting boys a year later is, it, as we just mentioned, it's motivated by this developmental gap. 
which is depending on how you measure it about a, a year boys are about a year behind girls especially in adolescence in the development of those study skills now as you just mentioned part of that is because the system because the way the system works now the system is rewarding those those skills that develop earlier in girls and especially in that critical period of high school and the, it's the transition from middle through high school and look one of my principles generally is look at what rich people are doing um and see whether or not they know what they're doing and that, that could be more broadly learned and and that, you know you do see this it's called red shirt academic red shirting so it's for academic reasons not athletic reasons but this is relatively common in upper middle class circles and indeed some private schools do it almost by default they have a second year of pre-k and that second year of pre-k is skews very male and so i see people with resources and means doing this and that makes me think hmm maybe there is something to this maybe not maybe they're all maybe they're, they're all wrong but i'm convinced enough by the evidence that in many cases uh, the boys in particular would benefit from an extra year of pre-K or double dose high quality before going into the school system rather than being held back later. Now, as a policy matter, there's all kinds of issues with doing it by default, changing birth dates, etc. There are some places that are looking at evaluating what that would look like to do that. And so I may have more to report on that, but obviously it would take a while to see what what the results are. I guess where I'd land on this is just that I think that it's certainly something that parents should think about and be able to do. There's a couple of cities now where it's actually not allowed. So New York and Chicago forbid parents from having that choice. And that just seems in the public school system, that seems deeply unfair to me. I think that if parents in consultation with the teachers think actually my son, and in some cases daughter, would benefit from just an extra year of development, they should have the ability to do that. Whether or not you can do it with a single stroke through public policy, I don't know. I will say this, though, that choosing any birth date as the cutoff date for school entry is an incredibly blunt instrument anyway. It's arbitrary. Um, right. And so, it, and people say, look, actually, there's a huge overlap between girls and boys on this front. That's true. There's also a huge overlap between grades. In fact, when I've looked at the evidence, the overlap in developmental ability between one grade of students and the grade above them is actually that overlap is tighter than between girls and boys within one grade. Mm. So I think that the point is just that these are blunt instruments anyway, and if we could get to a system that was more flexible, great. The second one, and it's timely, of course, because we're recording this the day after Pamela Harris announced Tim Waltz as her um, vice presidential candidate pick, and he's a high school teacher or former high school teacher, social studies, uh, which is very exciting to my son, who's just starting his career as a social studies teacher. So he sees this potential alternative <laughs> career path of, you know, our family text exchange is like, well, maybe one day you could be vice president. Um, uh, yeah. But actually, but also there's these lovely stories of these former students going down to the rally where he was announced because they wanted to see their old teacher, yeah, like traveling right. from across the suite. And when he became a teacher in the 1980s, about 33% of K-12 teachers were men. It's now down, as you said, to 23% and continues to fall year after year without much notice and without much attention and with basically zero policy response. And so the question is, does it matter if we have fewer and fewer men in our classrooms? You know, if it does, and we think representation matters, and I do, not least because I worry that the whole idea of educational excellence is increasingly coded as female. Right? If you're a boy and you come from a K-12 system where the girls are always doing better than the boys, right? that's the system that you're in now, almost all the teachers are women. The ones most likely to go to college are your female friends. Then it's not surprising if, especially at a young age, you form the idea that actually this whole education business is coded female. And in my case, it was a male English teacher that helped me move from remedial English to a much better level of English, um, which is probably one of the reasons I'm able to talk to you today. And it was Mr. Wyatt. Now, if it had been Ms. Wyatt, would it have the same impact? I'm just going to tell you, no. To me, as a you know, kid from a working class community, wondering what this is all about, to have a guy, and he was a Korean War veteran, uh, he was curmudgeonly, uh, you know, he had all of the affects you might expect. He wasn't very good at sticking to the curriculum. He was amazing. Um, but he, he lit this idea in my head, which is, oh, oh, interesting. Boys and men can get into words as well. And it was life-changing for me. And if you look at surveys, a number of people will say that. They'll look back to a teacher. And very often, if it's a man, sometimes even if it's a woman, it's a male teacher. So I think 
We need to learn more. There isn't much research on this. So I'll have to say that to you, Russ. There's some research showing the positive impact of male teachers, but it's a mixed field and there's not much. But I'm just going to go on a limb here and say, I don't think it's good if the teaching profession becomes all female. And I don't think we would think it was good if it was going in all male either. Uh, I think representation matters and 23% is way too low. And I would love it if policymakers could actually start acting on this before we drop below 20%. Because every percentage point we drop now, it gets harder and harder. I've mentioned I have a son who's entered the public school, the public teaching profession, but he's in a huge minority and he's faced a certain amount of stigma to, to do that, right? And so we're making it harder and harder for men to enter the profession because, because it's an odd thing for men to do now. It raises questions that I think are deeply unfortunate. I think the other part of that, which fascinating and not really um, measurable in any way, but as that number falls, the proportion of men the workplace, and this is true, of course, in, for both men and women, if there's a predominant male or female culture within the institution where you work, it can be uncomfortable. Not because there's sexism or uh, anything uh, conspiratorial. It's simply that it's a, an institution, a workplace, where women set the culture or vice versa. And we know that yes. there are many male cultures where women struggled to fit in because for a thousand reasons, but it goes, it's also true in the other direction that a predominantly female workplace in a cult it develops a culture that's different than a more mixed or a more male culture. It's just a fascinating aspect of this. And as it gets to a certain point, it's not just that it, it feels funny or gets stigmatized. It's just a, not necessarily where you want to work. Because you don't feel yeah. as comfortable. It just tilts that way. And, that's, and there is a little bit of evidence on this, which is from the work on women into male professions, where there is quite a big literature, as you might expect, yeah. especially women into STEM professions. And there is some evidence uh, of, of exactly what you've just talked about, which is a cultural tipping point, uh, which is that there's a certain level of representation below which you'll see it skew the other way. So, like, and, and it looks like it's about 30%. Right, from this evidence on women in STEM. It looks like if, you're, if you have fewer than 30% of a institution or a culture or a profession being male or female, then that's about the point where the culture will, will tip. And so what they see is as women broke the 30% barrier in many previously male professions, the culture really started to change quite quickly, right? Um, and so if that, to the extent that's right, let's take 30%. And that feels about right to me. It feels like once you get up to about one in three, uh, you know, that's different to being one in four or one in five, right? And not for nothing, of course, the share of men in teaching has gone past that tipping point. It was above that tipping point. It was one in three when Tim Waltz was a high school teacher and one in, one in three. And in high school, it was, you know, one in two and a bit above, right? It was lower in lower grades. And so it, it, you weren't in the minority, but increasingly you are. And the profession as a whole has now gone well below that tipping point. And it looks like below 30%, the culture is going to skew the other way and it gets harder and harder. So weird, weirdly, as women have broken the 30% barrier in most of the STEM occupations now, not all, but they're getting there, we've gone below the tipping point barrier, not only in education, by the way, but also the share of men in social work and psychology and other professions. So there's some professions, critical ones in my view, that have become female professions in my lifetime. But that didn't have to happen. And I don't think we should just be watching it happen and not acting. Uh, before we move on to the workplace and the family, uh, make it clear, and it's a fascinating observation, that among elites, highly educated, um, two high-earning parents, for example, a lot of these phenomena are less observed, that they're most extreme for low-income uh, families and minorities, and that for... Um, particularly blacks, but for uh, high-income families, uh, there's not as much of an effect. And therefore, they don't notice as, as much, and therefore, they're less likely to think of it as an issue. And one of the things you're, of course, doing is trying to uh, wave, the, wave the, the flag that this is, pay attention to this. Yeah, so I think the danger is that if you live in a certain kind of environment and you look around, and you see, well, you know, 
I, so I used to live in you know, Bethesda, Chevy Chase, Maryland, which is one of the richest zip codes in the US. And there was still a gender gap in the outcomes, but it was much smaller. And it was a sort of gap at the top of the distribution, right? So what it meant was the girls were going to the Ivy League colleges and the boys were just going to the University of Maryland flagship or whatever, right? I mean, and many of the boys were going to Ivy Leagues as well. So um, A, it was a less consequential gap and B, it was just so much smaller. Basically, all of the gaps that we've talked about so far, you can double them for kids from low income backgrounds, say bottom third of the income distribution, and you can double them for black kids. I think an unremarked upon aspect of this debate is how well black girls and black women are doing now compared to 20, 30 years ago in, on every front, uh, which is not to say that they're doing as well as they should in an equal society, but so much better. Whereas black men and black boys lagging way behind. Uh, and so that separation is huge. And so in, in education, especially, I think it's irresponsible now to show outcomes by race without also breaking by gender because you miss that massive gap between black boys and black girls. But I also think that the class dimension here is huge. And, and you're right, one of, my, one of my fears is that these upper middle class professionals, especially if they're still struggling with gender inequality in the workplace, going, let's go the other way, right? Well, women are still maybe underrepresented at the top. They're sort of leaning in, to use Sheryl Sandberg's phrase, but they're not looking down. And so they miss the very different story that you'll see at the bottom. And actually, Raj Chetty, whose work I'm sure you know out of Harvard, just produced a report a couple of weeks ago showing that um, boys, both boys and girls raised in white upper middle class households are doing even better if they were born in 1992 than if they were born in 78. So in other words, that kind of class stratification at the top, the way that upper middle class parents are able to kind of make sure their kids do okay, that's increased. Meanwhile, at the bottom of the distribution, you're seeing cratering prospects, especially for men. So white men raised in low-income households are worse off than the previous generation of white men raised in low-income households. Slight yeah. improvements for black, and you just don't see that. You don't if you don't if you don't if you don't have working-class friends. If you don't spend time in these communities, you miss the fact that working-class men and boys and and black boys and men, they're seeing their prospects not only not improve, but in many cases go backwards. There's a general feeling that. America's become more segregated by income uh, over the last 60, 70 years that the normal places where people would interact with people of different backgrounds and different income levels is uh, there's much less heterogeneity. I don't know if that's true, but if it is, and I, I believe it could be true, that certainly makes it harder for people to notice these trends, uh, at least for those at the top. It's a fascinating observation. Uh, Let's let's move to the workplace. Um, what's going on with men in the workplace that, that's alarming? Well, the class dimension here is hugely important too, because what you're you're obviously seeing growing wage inequality over the longer time, right? We're seeing better. It's been better in recent years, uh, but over the longer time scale, since say the '80s, we've seen much more robust wage growth at the top of the distribution than at the middle and the bottom. But that's especially true for men. And so it's actually still the case that most men are earning a little bit less today than most men were in 1979. That's, women have seen an increase in wages across the board. But for men who are not in that top 25%, 30% of the distribution, their wages have stagnated. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that, that you would be better placed, I think, probably to talk about, and certainly many of your guests will be, than I, but it's a fact. And I think that if you see it, if you're in a society where, you know, a small, a slight majority of men are going to do worse than their fathers did in terms of wages, that's, that's a big, that's a big fact. That's a big cultural fact as well as economic fact. And I don't think it's one that we can, even if we can explain it away by saying, well, they had rents before, they were perhaps, perhaps they were even overpaid before, perhaps their dads actually were overpaid against their productivity because of sexism, racism, and unions, right? That's a Scott Winship at the American Enterprise Institute has made that case very strongly recently. Even if that's true, even if you can explain the kind of economic logic behind stagnant male wages, that doesn't, that doesn't help the guy who's actually feeling that. And so we're seeing, and we're also seeing declining, of course, male labor force participation, but especially among the less skilled men. So this education gap that Case and Deaton and others have pointed out, 
really plays out for men. So for men with less education, coming back to our earlier point, there are still some pretty good jobs out there. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to overstate this, but there are fewer of those jobs than there were in previous generations. So it's harder and harder to make a good living as a guy without a decent education. And I think that's driving labor force participation down. So I'm skeptical about the claims about lack of progress. Um, typically, those claims are snapshots at different points in time. They're not following the same people. And when you follow the same people, uh, my reading of the data, I'll share with you off the air, uh, and listeners know from past episodes, my reading of that data is that it's actually much more cheerful that a lot of the gains, there have been a lot of gains at the lower end, meaning that low-income people over their lifetime experience substantial gains, and in particular, uh, children of low-income people do do fairly well in terms of progress. They start at a lower level, so in percentage terms, it can be uh, misleading. But the stagnation story, for me, is a combination of ignoring benefits, failing to follow people over time, and so on. But put that to the side. That's, a mm-hmm. again, another episode we could spend a lot of time on. Um, I think what's clear is that dropping out of high school uh, or not finishing college even, uh, going to college and not finishing, is increasingly penalized uh, in the workforce. As you say, there are some good jobs, obviously. Yep. Uh, and, and, and I think there's a lot of romance about, well, in the 1950s, you could, two people could, one person could stay at home and then they could still afford a nice house and so on. Uh, I think that misses a lot of different things. But what is true because of the changes in the economy and what is rewarded, uh, low-skilled people tend to have very stagnant prospects. And um, that has implications that we'll turn to in a minute way beyond their pers- their financial standard of living, their monetary uh, standard of living. But it's it's pretty clear to me that that not finishing high school is really bad. And that obviously is a bigger problem for uh, certain demographic groups. And that is a disaster, I think, for America going forward. And has been for yeah. two, three generations. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm very interested in the stagnation debate. Uh, I argue a lot with people like Scott Winship, yep. who I've mentioned today, <laughs> Michael, Stra- Michael Strain, of course, um, and others. Um I also worry a lot about this romanticization that you hear from kind of Oren Cass and others at Compass, so like, you know, with the one wage earner model, because um, I think the labor market is just, I just, we just live in such a different world that the sort of, the sort of nostalgia yeah. for affects that kind of analysis. So, um, and I do think that there are real arguments about stagnation debate. And I would also say that there's a danger that the folks like me who, who emphasize some of the kind of more of the downside trends, especially for men, including from the most recent, uh, Chetty work. Um, I may be missing some of the more recent improvements and or overstating it, not taking it. So I think it's a real, I'm just saying, I agree that there's a real debate there. Um, of course, not finishing high school is pretty unusual now in a way that it wasn't before. So there's a big composition change there, right? It's actually quite unusual now. And so the people who don't finish high school today are not like the people who didn't finish high school 40 years ago, right? So well you have to be a little bit careful. And, it, and it's a much smaller group as well. So there's a huge selection effect going on there generally. Yep. But if your basic, your basic analysis is correct, that being lower skilled, which probably now means some college, but no credential, or even in some cases, an associate's degree of very dubious economic value, like a general liberal arts associate's degree, right? Where there's just no evidence for a kind of return on that investment. Um, so, or, or you've taken a long time over getting it, right? No monetary return. Could have a large return. I, correct. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was speaking like an economist, which I'm not by training. Um, you're right. Uh, actually, if you've got, that's correct. Um but just from an economic point of view, and I'm sure we'll get to the implications of that later. Yeah, yeah, being the ability to find a good path in the labor market now with lower levels of skill, with what counts as low, changing a bit over time, it, that's just fewer of those paths available, uh, fewer of those opportunities than there were in a previous generation. And it looks to me as if that's hitting men harder than women right now that maybe they're struggling to update their priors to meet the new world. Maybe 
there's nostalgia. Maybe there's a sense they will be okay. I, I don't know, but it looks to me like women are upgrading their human capital for a world that's demanding more of it much faster and more effectively than men are. And that's driving a lot of the gaps that we just discussed. You know, you talk about uh, in your writing the importance of, say, vocational training uh, as an option. I agree 100 percent. It's an underutilized um, option. But it's interesting that we don't think about teaching our children those uh, intangible skills we mentioned earlier. So, as I've gotten older, uh, I've come to realize that uh, raw IQ is overrated. Uh, credentials are overrated. Uh, the quality of the credential is overrated. And often, the best people to work with and to cooperate with are uh, reliable, hardworking, trustworthy, um, honest. All of these things are really important. And they're not unrelated to the execution of, of a complex chain of tasks. So, you know, we don't teach time management. Take a trivial example uh, to high school kids generally. We don't teach them, uh, you know, we can think about uh had Angela Duckworth on the program talking about grit. Grit's a lovely thing. I'm not sure it can be acquired, but if it can be, it's really good to have it, um, to get it, because it counts for a lot more than I think people think about when they're 19, and certainly that I did when I was younger. And, you know, one, I'm not saying it's a policy recommendation, but a parenting and maybe a school recommendation is to pay some attention to these kinds of they're skills. They're, they're definitely skills. They're not algebra, but they're really valuable out in the world, and people get compensated for them eventually. Not necessarily in their first job, because their piece of paper is not as good as somebody else's, their, their credential, but eventually they're, they're incredibly well rewarded because they're scarce. So it's just something to think about. Yeah, and they're valuable skills. I mean, actually, I think one of the beautiful things about the labor market in a market economy is that it creates so many different routes and opportunities and niches, right? And so just on a you know very personal level, part of the conversation with it in our family would be like when we had a son who was really struggling at high school, um, you know, sometimes not going, not turning stuff in, just like, a, but he had two jobs, a landscaping job in the morning and a actually a teaching job kind of in the afternoon. And he never missed a day of work. And his uh, bosses thought he was amazing. And so I said to my wife, he's going to be fine. The labor market will save him, right? Once he gets into the labor market, he'll be fine because yeah. he's got all these other skills, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Um, but the trouble is that people are so obsessed with this kind of bottleneck sure. of education, especially higher education. And and I do think, I, I love the movements now uh, to kind of get rid of the the, ter the paper ceiling. I don't know if you've heard that term, no. right? The credential ceiling. Nice. Yeah, it's just, um, and, and uh, but even as things stand, I do think you're right that once you get into the labor market, if you've got those other skills, they do sort of shine through. Of course, you can get some of that in the formal education system. But it's one of the reasons why I'm also very focused on extracurricular activities, coaching. Like we mentioned Tim Waltz already. He was also a coach. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you see a decline in extracurricular activities, especially for boys. Uh, things like the Boy Scouts, we can't call them the Boy Scouts anymore. They've dropped the boy, so yeah. it's now Scouts Scouting for America, um, to my chagrin. But um, but I think, and or places of worship where you can be an altar boy or wh whatever. Shake your but I think a lot of those skills are actually acquired outside of the formal education system. Yeah, for sure. um, obviously, obviously, parents, obviously, the home. I haven't mentioned that, but also all these other spaces too. Yeah. And so, I actually think we should do. We should be thinking more about those other venues within which you learn those other skills. Uh, let's turn to the family. Um, obviously, in America and the West generally, uh, family life is incredibly different than it was 50 years ago. So, talk about some of those changes, and uh, we'll turn to the question: of What it means to be a father. Yeah, well, I just want to give a shout out to your last episode with uh, with Eric on becoming how becoming Eric a parent Howell. made him a better person. Yeah, oh well. Yeah, yeah, it was a lovely episode. Um, I just thoroughly recommend it, uh, and I felt a lot of affinity with with that discussion as a father myself. Um, yeah, and obviously, if you had Melissa Carney on, I can't remember if you've yeah. done her with, uh, but yeah. So he shares this book, The Two Parent Privilege, which 
just really, I think, does an excellent job of summarizing the kind of latest data on this. And the, the short version of this is that the dramatic transformation in the economic relations between men and women has meant that to a very large extent, we've achieved the goal that Gloria Steinem and others declared. Gloria's view was that we will have succeeded when women can choose marriage rather than being forced into it for economic reasons, right? So economic independence for women allows women to have much more choice and autonomy about forming romantic relationships. That is a wonderful thing. I think most people would agree that's a great thing. However, uh, the conservatives at the time in the 70s were right to say, well, hang on, what's going to happen to the men if the women don't need the men anymore? Right? You, you're breaking what is actually a pretty old contract here uh, for good reason. Um, but I think that because of that and for some other related reasons, we've seen a massive change in the standard way in which, especially in the US, children come into the world and are raised, broken along class lines. So here again, class becomes hugely important. So the share of college-educated women Indian college, who had a child outside of wedlock, the share of births outside wedlock, outside marriage. In 1990, that was 5%. Now it's 11%. So it's doubled, but from a low base. For everybody else, it's now above 50%. So for those outside of the college-educated class, it is now slightly less common to have a child inside marriage than outside marriage. So the average numbers are massively skewed by the fact that college-educated Americans, by and large, continue to get married, have children, and stay together. But that is not true for everybody else, and that's the other two-thirds. And so a view of parenting and of fatherhood in particular that presumes the old arrangement of traditional marriage is woefully out of date, at least outside of the upper middle class or the college-educated class. And that has meant that what it means to be a father who's engaged with your kids' lives, in my view, and here's where I run into some very serious arguments from social conservatives, ones I take very seriously, which is my view is that we can't put the genie back in the bottle, even if we wanted to, around traditional marriage based on the economic dependency of women on men. And so instead, we have to reinvent fatherhood as an institution that matters in and of itself, preferably inside a stable, committed, and even married relationship. But if necessary, and increasingly it is necessary, outside of that. In other words, the relationship between fathers and children can no longer be contingent on the relationship between fathers and mothers. I think that's where we are, and that's where we need to shape our policy for. But that is a very different view to those who would say that's what makes marriage so important. And I think that's an ongoing debate that I'm having. I will also say that on the left, there's sometimes been a reluctance to even admit that fathers matter in a way that's somewhat different to that of mothers. So... By arguing for fathers, but not hanging my hat on the marriage hook, I end up pissing off people on the right for not being pro-marriage enough and people on the left for being heteronormative in claiming that dads matter. But as I said at, at, at an event where I was accused of being heteronormative, if saying that dads matter to kids and to dads <laughs> makes me heteronormative, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll wear the label. If that's the price I have to yeah. pay, okay. I mean, it's um, <clears throat> you, you write very uh, movingly about your father. I'm going to read a, an excerpt here, and you can then expand on it. And you talk, for example, about the older image we had of men, uh, both on their own and in marriage, that men were lone rangers. They were individuals. They were rugged. They were tough. Um uh, and I think there's a certain heroic romance about being a man through most of human history. Uh, you know, it, it, it dies somewhere in the late 19th and early 20th century. But, it, you know, I like to joke that, you know, I was, I was raised by a 19th century father uh, who, who loved Kipling, for example. Uh, Kipling is a old-fashioned, no longer acceptable model for what it means to be a man. The the poem If, which I think is a great uh, model for how to be a, uh, what I would call a mensch, uh, a person of, of character. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little out of fashion. Uh, and so, this idea of, of men as lone rangers, you point out, is, is misleading. 
it, it's not completely true to our nature as men. You say, and here's the quote, my father's masculinity is relational. It is shaped and affirmed by his roles as a father, a husband, and community member. For his generation, the bedrock responsibility of an adult male was that of an economic provider. My mother worked too as a part-time nurse, but there was never any question about the division of labor. But it was far from the whole story. My father's role did not end with the paycheck. He was also our swimming coach, driving instructor, moving man, chauffeur, academic advisor, and much more besides. He served on the Parent Teacher Association, was active in the local Rotary Club, and coached junior rugby at our local club. Like my, fa like my mother, who was equally engaged in our community, my father's sense of self was created not in isolation and introspection, but through relationships and service. Uh, close quote. So it's a beautiful passage uh, and full of insight, I think, about what it used to be like to be uh, a man and a father, but certainly is still part of what I think, and you're saying, many men need desperately to feel significant. Uh, so talk about that if you want, or if you want to expand on it. Yeah, so there's this idea in anthropology that uh, I'm, I'm riffing on there through my own personal experience, which is the idea of mature masculinity being related to the idea of generating a surplus. Mm, yeah. so you're a surplus generator. And so you become a man. You move from boyhood to manhood when you generate more of something than you need for your own survival. Now, what that thing is will vary by context. It could be meat, it could be energy, it could be money, whatever. But, but the point is that you are a, you're generative, right? Um, and in the case of these relationships, what it's showing is that, you know, my father as this kind of model of relational masculinity was generating all kinds of stuff. He was, you know, generating economic, you know, for us, for us as a family, but then time and energy for the community. So he was giving more than he got. And, and that's a deep idea in anthropology about masculinity. And actually Margaret Mead, the anthropologist said that all known human societies have relied on the learned nurturing behavior of men. The learned nurturing behavior of men. And by nurturing, she didn't mean it in the more in intimate sense that you might think of it. She meant it in a more, quotes, male way, which was actually more about the tribe, more about the broader community. So sure, your own kids, but also there was something about masculinity that was broader than that. It was about taking care of a broader group. And I think Mead was right about that. And I think it's what I saw my father doing. Now, he wasn't patrolling the perimeters of the village in where I grew up with his spear <laughs> um, or hunting in an elk, but he kind of was just in a modern way. And, and the reason I feel so strongly about that, as opposed to this Lone Ranger idea, which I think is like, you know, it's a nice myth. You can kind of fit the cowboy and the guy. You know, there's something to that, like nostalgically, but it's anthropologically false and I think morally wrong because it leads men to believe that they should actually be for themselves. There's even this online movement in the manosphere called, they're called MGTOWs, and that stands for Men Going Their Own Way. They disavow relationships with women. It's a kind of male separatist movement. But even if they're not called that, you'll see in some of the kind of most influential men online, this sense of like, you should be for yourself, you know, make money. If you get women, they're almost like consumer goods, right? That you get because you've got the flashy cars and so on. And, you, and so it's about, it's about you. There's a narcissism to this, which I think is profoundly anti-male. And I think that a man going his own way in other words, living only for himself, is not a man by any plausible anthropological definition. So I think being for others and being relational, generating a surplus, is what it, is at what it has historically taken to be a man. And I fear we've lost that. And then what you end up with is a lot of men feeling like they're not sure they're needed. They're, and being unneeded is literally fatal in many cases. And so that sense of, I think, we've got to recreate a sense of neededness of men, how we need men in our families and in our communities and in our workplaces and so on. That's not going to be the same kind of need that we had before, but nonetheless still needed. And I think part of this, there's no empirical evidence for what I'm about to say, or hard to get, but, or lots of tangential evidence. But I, I genuinely believe part of the crisis we're seeing now is so many men being uncertain that they're needed, uncertain that they're wanted and needed in their communities and in our society. And that's, absolutely fatal, not only to the men themselves, but I would say for society, we do need men. Mm 
think about all those uh, those teams missing coaches. And so on the one hand, we have a lot of young men wondering if they're needed and what the purpose in life is, and a bunch of, of teams, particularly in lower-income areas, that are having to shut down because they can't find coaches, volunteer coaches. Surely there, there's the inkling of the kinds of ways we should be thinking about this. But too many men are benching themselves because they don't, they're not sure that society does need them. Yeah, I think of it a different way. <clears throat> I think of it as uh, the, need, the need to matter. Uh, that, that sense of purpose for, at least for men, I, I, I can't, I won't speak to women. Uh, it's funny how un, unacceptable it is to say that women don't have to worry about feeling needed because they can make children, <laughs> they can make babies. Uh, this remarkable, miraculous, um, extraordinary thing, I think should, should sh it matters. <laughs> it shouldn't be just ignored or, or, or not spoken of. And obviously there are many women who, have wonderful lives and careers that have nothing to do with having children. They never have children. I'm not saying anything about uh, that, that women need to do this, but many women come with that purpose as a given because they've had children or are going to have children. Um, men don't have that as intensely and they look to matter. They look to be, uh, as you, you call it needed, and that's as and that's as good a phrase as any. Um, you know, you you point out uh, forty percent of the families in the United States women women are the main breadwinner. It's glorious. Um, mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing. No one no one's saying that that this, these problems and challenges should be solved by. Well, many are, some are, but most of us would argue that the, that the way to fix that is to reduce women's economic autonomy and and career autonomy. Um, you point out forty percent of women earn more than the average man, which is quite quite an interesting thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I suggest that a lot of the failure to, for that to be 50% uh, is, or, or whatever you, you think the right number is, is due to personal preferences of what women want to spend their time doing versus men. But put all that to the side, for a variety of reasons, men don't feel as important as they did two or three generations ago. One of the things that's led to, you point out, is a much higher suicide rate, much higher drug overdose rate. It's not a small difference. It's not like men are 20% more likely to have these challenges. So talk a little bit about the magnitudes of these, this dysfunctionality, really. Yeah, so I'll start by, I agree with you that actually I've just been reading something about mattering and that sense of how, you know, why I matter. And, and I think there is a difference between men and women on this. And I don't think we have to be too apologetic about the fact that it is a little bit more baked in for women. But across human history, most women have reproduced. And so that sense of being kind of reproductively necessary is, is kind of somewhat baked in, even for women who maybe don't reproduce, right? I just think that's, that identity is somewhat less fragile, whereas only 50% of men have, have historically reproduced. And the role of men in relation to the community and to the family has always been a bit more fragile, a bit more contingent. And so I think that the sense of male mattering, to use your terminology now, has always been somewhat more socially constructed than female yeah. and always under construction and changing. But that means that the cultural task of ensuring that there are ways in which men feel like they matter or that they're needed is hugely important. And a failure for men to feel that does uh, upstream, leads downstream to, I think, these huge consequences that you've talked about. So maybe we lose 40,000 men a year to so deaths by suicide, which is four times as many as the number of women that we lose. So it's a four times higher rate. And that's about the same as the number of women that we lose each year to breast cancer, just to kind of put it in, to put the absolute numbers in perspective. What really troubles me is that since 2010, almost all the rise in suicide, and it's rising uh, in the US, almost all the rise for men has been among young men. So prior to 2010, it was really middle-aged men where you saw the suicide rates increasing you know, from 1999 through that first decade of the century, it was really middle-aged men. And that's consistent with the deaths of despair story in the economy. But since then, suicide rates have flattened out, thankfully, for middle-aged men, but they've shot up for young men. So they're, they've risen by a third just since 2010 among young men. And as you mentioned, uh, drug poisoning rates much higher among men than among women. Um, similar kinds of magnitudes, three three times higher, say. 
Uh, and so these crises that we're seeing playing out, I think that to some extent, you know, the term deaths of despair is now being contested because it sort of points the finger a little bit, maybe individuals. But, but I, don't, I think it does capture something real, which is what, what we just talked about, which is a sense of being needed and, and mattering. And I do quote some research by a, uh, an academic called Fiona Shand, where she looked at the words that men use to describe themselves before their suicide attempts. And in most cases th- with men, those attempts are tragically successful and and then did a word analysis and she found that the two words that men were most likely to use to describe themselves when they reached that point were useless and worthless so obviously that's a selected sample of people who've chosen to take their lives um but but as to why they have it is just this sense of the most the ultimate and most tragic expression of feeling worthless useless, not needed, actually genuinely coming to believe the world would be better off without you. That is a predominantly male phenomenon. And it's a growing problem, among, especially among our young men. And so all of these other fact, things we've talked about, the economy, education, public policy, and so on, I think they should be grounded in this kind of real sense of compassion that we need to feel for the plight of many of these men. Um, and, and for these tragic consequences, I just don't think you can you can lose forty thousand men every year uh, to suicide and be complacent about what's driving them. And I'm intrigued by the role that marriage plays in in giving men a sense of purpose, regardless of whether they're the main breadwinner or not. I, I think, uh, and again, there's enormous differences in, in income level, education level for these phenomena. The the um, huge change in in both delaying marriage or not marrying at all uh, is, I think, hard on both men and women, uh, but per, perhaps it is harder on men, and it certainly is harder uh, for men, I think, to find uh, the civilizing impact that marriage has, to find a substitute for that, along with all the other things that your father uh, and I think many men of... of of a certain age got involved in uh, as married men because they had children and they were coaching little league or involved in their, their church or a uh, place of worship. And uh, I've quoted it before a friend of mine, whose father says, until you get married, you're an idiot. Uh, that That's a, a statement about men. No one would argue. I think, I don't think he would have argued that, uh, women need marriage to avoid idiocy. It's men that do. And anybody, I think, who's been married understands that marriage uh, civilizes one in all kinds of beneficial ways, not just for oneself, but for those around us. And your father and and this sort of uh, traditional relational aspect of, of fatherhood and, the, and husbanding that you talk about— uh, is inevitably leads to feeling like you matter. <laughs> First of yeah. all, you have someone you live with. Second of all, you've got children who depend on you. Third of all, you have all these institutions that you're entangled and interwoven with that where you're contributing. Yeah. And forget whether you're contributing more than you take, but you're certainly contributing. And um, it, the lonely, um, the more isolated adulthood that is more common now is not healthy. Again, I have wonderful, connected, relational friends who are not married and and lead very meaningful lives. So it's not suggesting that this is the only route to those uh, meaningful ways of living, but traditionally it's re- it's sort of a minimal way to make sure you get yeah. there. And yeah. we don't have that as much. No, and it's the it's the easier route for sure. And I think it's okay to say that, that, it, that if it's institutionalized, it's easier. And, and a couple of data points on this. One is it's very interesting to me now that men rate getting married and having children as more important than women do That's in the US. Those lines have crossed. Um, and I think that's, I think men intuit some of what you're saying. It is also true that wifeless men are a bit of a mess right now. And so I mentioned that the suicide rate is four times higher among men than women generally. But if you look at men and women post-divorce, it's eight times higher among divorced men than among divorced women. 
the health of men gets worse, their wages don't do as well. There's all this evidence that, you know, these institutional forms, especially marriage and traditional family, provide a structure for men without which they struggle more than women. I just, the evidence on that is crystal clear. The problem is, and I love the idiot quote, the problem is that we're in a situation now where women aren't willing to marry idiots <laughs> and then help them become non-idiots. Yeah. Uh, they used to be, and I, I think, honestly, my previous, I, you know, hopefully my father won't watch this one, but like they married in their early 20s. They married in 21, and I'm sure my father was a bit of an idiot. But having kids and, you know, helped move him beyond that. But women now are looking to marry men who are all, who've already ceased to be idiots rather than marrying them to help them to cease to be idiots. Yeah. And in the meantime, to the extent we are still idiots, there's a huge gap in supply and demand in the marriage market right now. And so I think this is a very difficult transformation because I don't really blame young women for saying no to the proposition that they should marry men in order to civilize them. Yeah, it's um, it's a really appealing. bad offer, right? <laughs> it's a terrible offer, right? You go to a successful 28-year-old woman and just say, I know you're doing great. Would you mind taking this guy on? He's a bit of an idiot, but if you work on him for a few years, he'll be more useful to society. Young women are now both able and willing to say, no thanks. Right, yeah. And so that's, and, and unless we can somehow get women to change that view, and, and actually I think what's happened is that we've unbundled the marital contract and one side of the marital contract was the economic dependency of women on men. The other side was the emotional dependency of men on women. Yeah. And, and that second part of it is now being revealed because we were so focused on the first part of it. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that we should somehow kind of like find a, 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 how we'd bribe young women to kind of take that role on again. But so a better route forward is to actually help men find ways to become non-idiots yes. to use your friends without, without women having to do it for them. And I think that's where these other institutions and friendships. So as men, we are going to have to adapt um, and move out of idiocy without necessarily the help of women. Um, uh, but we're in this difficult transition phase now where I just genuinely think that's quite difficult. And of course, as you say, we're marrying so much later the that's a kind of that's that's the challenge of men in their 20s now is how do i grow up without a woman to help me doing it and that's something that the rest of us can help them with yeah i'm that's a good point to close on um you have staked out an intellectual and policy niche that is um <clears throat> I'll, I'll just call it unfashionable um <clears throat> first of all you're not worrying about women you're mainly worrying about men. Uh, you're not worrying about any residual sexism that is holding women back. You're focusing on cultural changes that, that make it hard for boys and men to, to lead uh, successful lives. Reflect on uh, what that's like and why you cho you're choosing this path. It's a relatively young enterprise and, and your your um uh institute it's also um a moment in in history where all these things are in flux and it's it's kind of a a crazy time but i would just say you're for a pretty normal person richard you you've chosen a very politically incorrect um focus for the for at least this part of your life oh, why and how's that going well, I, I appreciate the compliment uh, of being a normie. I'm a proud normie. Um, and and that's, that's one of the reasons why, because I didn't think enough normal people were doing this work on behalf of boys and men. Um, actually, most of the discussion about it, I think, was being led by non-normal people, especially online and especially in more reactionary circles. It wasn't being taken ser as seriously enough in policy circles, in think tanks like the Brookings Institution, in governments, in universities. And, and actually some people felt it was just inappropriate to do that. I was warned against this work many, many times. But I've been really pleased by the fact that although it's felt, it felt pretty unfashionable three years ago, I honestly think it feels a bit less so today. But the permission space around this subject has significantly widened. Uh, and I see it as part of my role to just continue bit by bit to widen the permission space so that 
I hope that within a very short period of time, people will say, well, of course we have an American Institute for Boys and Men. Like, why wh haven't we always had that? Why, why would that be a controversial thing? Because we've just done solid work on the issues that we've talked about here, but crucially, in a way that in no way sets men against women. It is quite clear that a world of floundering men is unlikely to be a world of flourishing women. And as evidence for that, I'll point to the fact that Melinda French Gates, one of the leading lights of the women's movements, just asked me to spend $20 million of her money <laughs> on boys and men. Now, why would such a high profile feminist spend her own money on boys and men? And the reason, as she said publicly herself, is because it's not good for women and girls if boys and men keep struggling. And so she has vaulted over the zero sum framing. She has allowed herself to think two thoughts at once. She has said, we can simultaneously work on women in politics, women in leadership, women in vet. There's still a bunch of stuff for people to do for women. And to be clear, I do think that that work on behalf of women and girls remains important. It's just that it's also important to be working on the issues of boys and men. So right now, my mission is on the second half of those. But if there were no think tanks, no departments, no public policy intellectuals, no government departments focused on women and girls, I'd probably be focused on women and girls. If I was in Afghanistan, I don't think I'd have the same mission or Iraq or Iran. But in the US right now, there hasn't been enough serious talk about the problems of boys and men. There's been lots of froth, lots of culture war stuff. And I'm a serious, normal person. And our institute is doing serious, normal work. And that's how you, that's how you make progress. And it's also how you cut off the supply lines to the nutters, right? There are people online, I'm sorry, that's a politically incorrect term, I apologize. But for the fringe people out there on the manosphere, the way to deal with them is to just say, look, if they're pointing out some of these issues that boys and men are facing, and we've talked about a lot of them now, they're not wrong. They're wrong to say the answer is go back or be anti-women or whatever. The solution is to tackle those problems. And that's my mission. And it's the mission of the Institute. And I would say so far, so good, Russ. My guest today has been Richard Reeves. Richard, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.